and welcome to the Manfred Olsen Planetarium virtual program. We're starting Cultura Celestialis today, a series of four programs, and it's my pleasure to introduce David Pacifico, who is an associate um, professor in the uh, his art history department of uh, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and who's also the director of the Emil Mathis Art Gallery, also at UWM. Um, I'm very glad that you're all here with us. We're having a we're going to have an excellent transportation to Peru. I'll give it to you, David. Welcome. Well, thank you so much. <clears throat> well, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, stargazing uh, in the Andes. Uh, so a little bit about myself or a little bit more detail. Let's see. Um, so when I am uh, not here on campus, I work in Peru. And here I am uh, in the uh, Cosmo Valley. This is actually on a dune uh, at the top of the dune uh, called Manchan. Uh, you can see there the irrigated valley below and, of course, the foothills of the Andes Mountains. And when I'm not uh, in the foothills of the Andes Mountains, I am here on campus uh, in the Emil H. Mathis Art Gallery, um, collaborating and working with our colleagues on uh, group shows for faculty, uh, graduate student thesis shows, and undergraduate shows, as well as individual shows by faculty and, and others. So this gallery is also, I should say, free and open to the public, and I invite you to come on down. So uh, the main area that I'm gonna be talking about today, hold on, uh, is in uh, is Peru, there we go. Sorry, I was just losing some of my controls here uh, on the screen and I wanted to make sure I had them right. So here's a map of South America and the area that we're gonna be focusing on is right here, Peru on the west coast of South America. And while it's far to the south of us, it's actually in the same time zone, although they don't do daylight savings. Um, so uh, the places we will be focusing on within Peru are going to be Cusco down here in the South Central Andes in the mountainous part of Peru. We'll talk about Lima, uh, the central coast and the national capital, as well as the north coast of Peru where I actually do most of my research. I like to show this uh, map because it shows the extreme topographic diversity of Peru, uh, and also the juxtaposition of very different altitudes, which means the juxtaposition of different ecological resources that can be combined and traded and exchanged and inter, uh, uh, intercalated or, or connected in very different ways. So uh, here on the coast, we have a very thin strip of, um, of desert. Uh, I liken it to Los Angeles, where you have a desert that's foggy and uh, then gives way to very tall mountains almost immediately. And in Peru, it then drops down on the east side of the Andes uh, to the Amazon. Uh, and the distance between the coast, the mountains, including snow-capped mountains, and the tropical rainforest can be as little as uh, 60 miles. Um, you know, if, if you wonder what the weather is like on the coast here, a foggy desert, uh, we checked the weather today at 66, uh, overcast and foggy, kind of like today's weather uh, in Wisconsin. However, I should say that on the North Coast, uh, where I work and we'll talk about a little bit, they call it uh, Cosma, particularly where we'll, where we'll look at a, a particular monument, uh, Ciudad del Eterno Sol, because it's the city of the eternal sun. It's always sunny in Cosma. And of course, in Cusco, it's mountainous, it can be cold, it can be hot, uh, and uh, pretty sunny there as well. So what time periods are we talking about? So there've been people in South America since at least 12,000 BC, and there's evidence for even uh, deeper uh, time depths, even deeper and, and earlier settlements. But we're gonna cover a, a couple of periods. We're actually gonna go as far back as 400 BC, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the height of the Inca Empire, about 1430 AD. Um, 
we're going to also mention 1532. This is the moment where there's a major change in Peru because the Spanish show up. Now, lots of things continue from before the colonial period, before the Spanish show up. Lots of things change um, as well, and it leads to some really interesting things, uh, some of which we will see today. Interesting things that relate to the sky and stars. We will talk about colonial or vice regal art, which is uh, art that was made in the Andes in the period after Spanish colonization, but before uh, Peru became an independent nation in the 1800s. We're really gonna talk a lot about the periods of the 1600s and the 1700s. And we'll also talk briefly about um, the present day when interest in the sun and celestial objects as relating to, or, or the legacy I should say of Inca interest in the sky continues. All right, so a couple of basic things about Andean society that, that I want to share with you. So these are generalizations about the Incas, but they also in large part uh, can be applied to other pre-colonial uh, cultures in the Andes, as well as the legacy of those pre-colonial cultures into the present. So the Incas were the latest of many states and empires. So uh, all, we hear the most about them because the Spanish encountered them because they spread all over Peru and beyond. It was a very broad empire, um, but there were others as well that preceded them. Uh, just, it's, an, it's important to know that, in fact, they may have borrowed some of the, the strategies of those earlier empires. The Inca realm was called Tawantinsuyo. That means in their native language, Quechua, of which there are still several million speakers today, uh, Tawantinsuyo means the land of the four quarters. Now, uh, the, the four regions. Um, now, the head of the Inca empire was himself called the Inca, or more precisely, the Sapa Inca. It's important to note they had a non-monetary economy. So when we talk about gold, uh, we're not talking about gold coins. We're talking about gold being used in a different way. And I'll, I'll get into that in a few moments. Whereas we think of church and state being separate and an economy being uh, somewhere in the middle or somehow related, Inca, economy, religion, and politics were intertwined and centered on the Sapa Inca. So the head of the church, the head of the state, and the head of the economy were one person, the Sapa Inca. Now, the last thing I want to point out is that there were uh, there is a, a generalized worldview that the Incas held that in some ways still has a legacy that is practiced and understood today. And that's a worldview of three realms or three pachas. Pachas is Quechua. It means realms or worlds or, or lands. Um, there's the upper realm or the celestial realm, Hanan Pacha, so that's Quechua. The lower or inner world or interior world, which is called Uku Pacha and the superficial world, or what we might call this world, the one that we encounter in our everyday lives, Kaipacha. So those are the Quechua terms uh, that refer to the three components, fundamental components of, of an Inca worldview and its legacy. So we're gonna head down to Cusco uh, and we are going to look at um, how the Incas thought about the sky uh, from the center of their empire. So this is the Plaza de Armas, the Spanish word for the main square in Cusco, which in the time of the Incas was also the main square of the Inca capital of Cusco. And they called it Huacaypata. This is the place where uh, the uh, Sapa Inca would carry out many ceremonies, of which we'll discuss shortly. I wanna start with something that we share with the Incas, which is an interest in constellations of stars. Oh, no, I wanna tell you a little bit about Inca art. Uh, and where we're going. Um, so this is actually a work that tells us about the history of the Incas. It was done in the um, in the independence period, so it's a little bit later, 1837, by Marcos G. Tupa Chavez, uh, and it shows the founder of the Inca dynasty, Manco Capac, uh, and his consort, uh, Mama Okyo. And you'll notice that they are uh, they are referring, they're touching uh, celestial objects, Manco Capac, the sun. Mama Okia, the moon. We have a series of the descendants, the, the lineage uh, of Inca kings, ending with Huayna Capac, who is the last known unique Inca king, who died possibly of hemorrhagic fever, possibly brought over by the Spanish, but arriving ahead of them in Peru. Basically, the germs traveled faster. Who had two rival sons, Huascar and Atahualpa, 
who were fighting for the, the throne, essentially, when the Spanish arrived and, and facilitated to some degree the, um, the conquest. In this particular uh, work of art, we also see a reference to whomever may have been the liberator of Peru. There's a number of them, San Martin, Simón de Bolívar, are associated with the liberation of Peru or its independence from Spain. Um, so let's take a look at one of the things that those Incas would have been interested in that we are too. We both would have recognized uh, this traditional constellation of stars, the Pleiades. Now, the Incas were interested in the Pleiades, however, for slightly different reasons than we are and had a different name. Uh, the Incas referred to the Pleiades as Colca. Uh, Colca is the Quechua word that means storehouse. Now, why would storehouse be the word they use for the Pleiades? Well, the Pleiades dip below the horizon at the end of a growing season in April in the Southern Hemisphere, and they emerge from the horizon. They rise again around the June solstice, which marked two things. The beginning of the growing season in June, or a new growing season, for they have several actually a year. Uh, in Peru in the Southern Hemisphere, they can have several growing seasons as opposed to our one brief one here in, in uh, Wisconsin. Um, but that growing season that starts with the solstice is also was also understood by the Incas, or, or it marked the beginning of their calendar year because it's the day when the days start to get longer. Um, and I do wanna point out that it's here in the Huacaypata that the Sapa Inca would ceremonially break ground in June to mark the beginning of a new growing season and the beginning of a new calendrical year marked by the rising of the Pleiades and the expanding days after the solstice. So um, one of the materials that would have been uh, most important to the Incas uh, would, be, would be gold. And uh, here you see plenty of gold uh, adorning uh, this uh, re reenactor, probably uh, reenacting or, or impersonating, or I should say, uh, taking the role of Pachacuti, one of the uh, classic Incas who um, is thought to have expanded the realm significantly, uh, including creating constructions of Machu Picchu and lots of expansion of the empire into very distant areas. So we're gonna take a turn uh, away from uh, the traditional uh, constellations that we're familiar with and the Pleiades uh, towards something a little bit different. And uh, to kick that off, I'm actually gonna play a song uh, that I really like uh, by, uh, uh, Grupo Rosado, which is called, which means, uh, it's sort of name, it's sort of pink group, um, from the 70s, I believe, or late 60s, a, a genre of music uh, called uh, psychedelic cumbia or el sonido amazonico, the Amazonian sound. In any case, I love this one because it reminds me of space. Uh, and, and although we won't hear the lyrics, uh, it basically talks about um, the expansive emptiness of being in the countryside. Uh, and perhaps uh, it, it makes us think a little bit about the expansive sky we can see when in the countryside at night, uh, we look up at the stars. <laughs> So I'm kind of curious to, to draw your attention and, and ask you what you see here, because the Inca saw something here uh, that would be, um, I think, a little bit different than the way we would probably look at it today. So the Incas were particularly interested in uh, the dark ways within uh, the Milky Way. So this is an image of the Milky Way uh, here at the center of the screen, which is visible in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, I can attest to that personally. Um, and the Incas viewed it as an extension of the earthly river into the celestial realm. And they were particularly interested in the dark ways, those spaces between the, um, the clusters of stars in the Milky Way. Uh, 
And they particularly recognized a number of things that had symbolic meaning within their understanding of the world. So the Incas were really interested in archi uh, architecture, they were, certainly were, but um, agriculture, they were also interested in animal husbandry, particularly uh, llamas or llamas. So here you see a schematized view, and we'll take a couple other looks at this, with a llama at the center of it. They were also really interested in reproduction. If you have a, a agrarian economy, if you need to grow things uh, to have uh, wealth and plenty, well, then the reproduction of llamas would be a very important uh, concern for you. And here we have a baby llama. Um, fox is an earth, uh, an earth spirit, transcends Kaipacha, this sort of uh, this world. Um, and of course, a shepherd or for the llama. They have a perdiz, yutu, uh, which is the Quechua word. I should say we have here the Spanish perdiz, we have the Quechua, yutu, and we have the English partridge. Uh, a, uh, a toad or a sapo in Spanish or hampatu is another creature that can transcend between worlds because toads hop on the surface, but also can burrow. And of course, famously serpiente, snake or macha quay. Um, which is a very famous animal for being able to transcend this world, Kaipacha, into Ukupacha, the interior world, because it burrows into the ground. Indeed, I should point out that they can also go into the celestial sphere uh, in the sense that they can climb trees, especially in the jungle. Here is an enhanced uh, view of the Milky Way where you can start to see how those uh, uh, dark ways become, uh, become uh, visible as perhaps a fox with glowing eyes, a human with arms and legs here, and a little head, um, a partridge, a sapo, or a toad, and of course, the serpent. And here it is, um, just highlighted one more time with uh, the snake, toad, partridge, uh, mama llama, if you will, uh, baby llama, uh, and then the fox. So how do we know about these things? Well. Uh, there were a number of people writing around the time of the Spanish conquest or the Spanish arrival uh, who were connected with the Incas, with the Inca royalty. And one of them was um, Guaman Poma, who essentially wrote a, an extensive graphic novel, if you will, to the King of Spain, both to give his account of Inca history, to make some claims about his place within it, um, and who might uh, be the, the indigenous people that deserve to have uh, power and nobility after the conquest, but also to tell the Spanish king some of the things that the Spaniards in Peru ought to be doing better. Well, within this massive document that he created, we see a number of myths as well, and things that deal with the celestial concerns of the Incas. So here we have three caves being depicted. This is Parcaric Tambo, uh, where you have the mythical origin place of the Inca dynasties. And this is uh, uh, noting a, a, a noble person here. Uh, it's probably meant to be Manco Capac, um, uh, the, the founder of the Incas. Uh, but you see above it, we have the sun, we have the moon, and we have what is understood to be uh, Venus, another uh, primary concern of the Incas. So uh, here you see the sun being offered a drink. Well, in the Andes, uh, a toast or drinking, ceremonial drinking is an important part of religious practice and rituals. Here you see the Sapa Inca, and we know he's the king because of his frond here. This is um, essentially the crown of the realm. He's toasting with the sun. Uh, the sun would have been called Inti, uh, and it's Pachacuti Inca, about 1430, um, who is thought to have been instrumental in creating a monotheistic cult around the sun from which Pachacuti explained he himself was, was a descendant. But in this particular image, we might think of uh, the, the narrative being that, sure, you know, some of these earlier uh, Inca kings were, were venerating the sun, but the fact that we have a flying demon uh, offering the sun his part of the toast suggests that maybe Guaman Poma is trying to gain favor with the Catholic, uh, the Catholic monarchy by uh, leveraging himself against traditional uh, Inca religion, which would, was seen by the Spanish as idolatrous. Yeah, and finally, I want to point out this image from Guaman Poma showing the Inca stopping to venerate the sun uh, with the moon also looking on. Um, and I like here how uh, you have a Spanish 
view of the sun. And I wonder if this isn't uh, to some degree suggesting, well, you know, if the Incas still venerate the sun, then the sun must be somehow uh, um, uh, Hispanicized or, or connected at least visually with uh, the um, conquering Spanish uh, uh, power structure, basically the conquistadors and the king. So in any case, uh, we're gonna stay uh, down here in uh, Cusco, and we're gonna look at some of the architecture uh, that was influenced by Inca concerns with the sun. So um, here we have the convent of Santo Domingo in downtown Cusco. And I wanna point out to you uh, this gray wall here, this strong foundation that is classic Inca stonework. And the reason that it's uh, here and the reason the convent is there is because this was the Cori Cancha, uh, Cori meaning gold. Uh, Cori Cancha is one of the most important uh, temples in the Inca uh, capital of Cusco, which the Spanish recognized and promptly put their church on top of it. What's a good strategy for uh, uh, asserting authority? Put your building of authority on top of the previous people's building of authority. Now, I have to say it wasn't just the Spanish who did this because the Cori Cancha itself was located on top of even an even earlier temple. So you have an, a pre-Inca temple, an Inca temple, the Cori Cancha, uh, and the convent of Santo Domingo. But why does it matter that it's the Cori Cancha, the gold uh, enclosure, the gold temple? Because gold was the material manifestation of the sun. Uh, gold was thought to literally be the material of the sun and silver, incidentally, of the moon, its counterpart. Uh, and we don't see gold on the Cori Cancha today because the Spanish quickly wrenched it off. Um, and melted it down. It might actually be in the uh, Museum of the Americas in Madrid right now. Um, but in any case, this uh, lovely creative lighting work gives us a sense of what it might have looked like. So this was a central uh, temple in Cusco, and it was a temple to the sun, the Golden Temple, Cori Cancha. So it wasn't just in the Inca capital that uh, architecture was influenced by Inca concerns with uh, the heavens, so to speak, but also in the uh, countryside uh, outpost, if you will, um, of Machu Picchu. So I'm gonna show you a picture of Machu Picchu uh, as it was photographed around 1913 by Hiram Bingham, uh, essentially when it was rediscovered uh, by uh, scholars. So this is Machu Picchu, uh, as it was seen in 1913. I wanna point out to you a couple of features here that we'll see in higher relief in a moment, uh, but you can see there's little niches here, uh, looks like little windows, and also a couple back here. Um, trapezoidal windows and niches are iconic of Inca architecture and um, trapezoidal niches, specifically, not that go all the way through as windows, but niches suggest we're looking at a temple. Well. Here's Machu Picchu today, and you can tell it's a recent image because the security guard is wearing a COVID mask, but it's the very same view. And what you can see here is those niches that I pointed out down here, as well as uh, this niche right here. And while you can't exactly make out from this photo what we're looking at, you can in this photo. And this is the Intihuatana, also known as the hitching post of the sun. You can see both the trapezoidal window as well as a trapezoidal niche, uh, suggesting this was a temple for a solar, essentially a sundial of sorts. Uh, and I wanna point out that it's carved out of living rock or bedrock that's emerging from the earth. This could be thought of as a place where the celestial realm, where the sun is hitched to the, or connected in some, some way, in any case, certainly they didn't have a world, um, to a sundial that itself transcends to the interior of the earth, a, a, a transcension of those uh, really three realms, Ukupacha, what's under the surface, Kaipacha, the surface world, and Anampacha, what we see um, in the sky. The Incas thought of these places of convergence of the worlds or passageways between the worlds as huacas. Uh, and this would have been a very important huaca. And here's another view uh, you can see in context with uh, Huayna Picchu, one of the peaks and a smaller peak uh, behind it. You can really get a sense that this is emerging out of the living rock, that sort of a melding of natural and then sculpture and then connection uh, to the sun uh, via shadow. So now we're gonna travel in time and in space uh, to uh, Huaraz, 
And I'm gonna, uh, sorry, to, to the coast of Huaraz, uh, to the city of Casma on the north coast of Peru. And we're gonna hear uh, another lovely song uh, by Los Desteos called Constelación, uh, another version of um, psychedelic cumbia that really I think captures kind of a sense of- Before you play that- Sure, Hold on. Um, I just wanted to ask something about the maps yeah. that occurred to me now. Yeah. Are the all caps regions then? Yeah, these are major cities um, and they would be district uh, capitals. So like Huaraz is the major city here uh, in uh, the, the Departamento of Ancash or the state of Ancash. And Huaraz is the, the sort of the state capital. And then I the, see. And these smaller ones are, are regional cities. Um, so Lima is, is you know, it's the capital of the nation and uh, and the, the department and Huancayo, Huancavelico, Ayacucho. Okay, yeah, those, are basically those are big capitals. cities. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, and we're going to go, uh, we're actually take a look at uh, Chimbote, which is a famous um, fishing area. Uh, and then we're going to travel to uh, nearby Cosma. <laughs> So uh, this, I should just point out before we go on, this is uh, Ch the, the Bay of Chimbote. Uh, and you have here uh, actually guano islands, which were uh, mined for fertilizer. You have uh, fishing fleets here. You have this expansive, uh, low lying industrial city. It was also made famous in a very famous book, The Fox from Up Above and The Fox from Down Below that talks about industrial coastal life in the 1950s in Peru. Um, so outside of Chimbote, a little bit further south in the, in the city, well, the countryside outside of Casma, the, its near neighbor, uh, we have this interesting site uh, called Chanquillo. This site uh, reminds us that it wasn't just the Incas that cared a lot about the sun. Uh, in fact, uh, the sun has been a concern for Andean peoples for quite a long time. This site dates to about 400 BC, uh, and it consists of two main constructions. Here we have this series of concentric rings, um, partially fortress, uh, partially temple. Doesn't really seem to have been uh, authentically or seriously defensive, but maybe a kind of temple fortress in a form of ritual warfare. You can see uh, restricted entry doors here and increasingly intimate inner sancta. You also see this interesting uh, feature over here. Um, that feature is a series of 13 towers. Uh, now, these 13 towers are actually precursors for, for similar towers that the Incas uh, themselves had. What were they doing with those? Well, these are uh, solar, it's a solar observatory. Now, from a structure where this picture was taken, the sun would rise at the June solstice here, uh, when it was at its lowest point here, the equinox here, at its highest point here, and then at the December solstice uh, here. So people as early as 400 BC were making architecture like the Incas did at the Coricancha uh, that was influenced by their concerns with the sun. Whether this was used for, uh, for rituals or predicting um, when various seasons should start, probably the answer is that it was all of these things. Uh, and that in a, an environment that's equatorial, so we have pretty much the same weather all year round with some minor variations, uh, having a series of constructions to use as an observatory could be quite useful. So now I wanna take you uh, from long before the Incas to just after the Incas. We're gonna head to Lima, uh, to the lovely neighborhood of Barranco, which is uh, a beautiful Bohemian place, uh, just south of central Lima uh, and uh, the El Museo Pedro de Osma, that's the, the Pedro de Osma Museum of Colonial Art. Because I want to show you the legacy of the Inca's interest in the sun and how it plays out in post colonial art or vice regal art. That's to say, art of the 17th and 18th century or the 1600s and 1700s. 
Um, so here we have the Virgin of the Rosary with Santo Domingo, Santa Rosa, San Vicente Ferrer, and an angel. It's anonymous. It's from the 18th century. It's Cusco style, and uh, it has gold leaf on it. Um, you'll also notice that this isn't just a, a typical halo around uh, the Virgin of the Rosary, but it's an awfully celestial looking uh, halo. What does that mean? Well, in two ways, uh, we can think of this image being a legacy of Inca uh, concerns with the celestial realm. Number one, the gold leaf is snuck in there as a nod or a continuation of the belief that the sun symbolize, uh, sorry, that gold symbolizes the material of the sun itself. And if that weren't subtle enough, uh, the rays coming out of this halo tell us that it is awfully reminiscent and deliberately so of uh, the legacy of Inca solar worship with post-colonial Christian and Catholic um, beliefs. We call this syncretism, the mashing up of, um, of indigenous and colonial belief systems into artworks. Now I should say the Spanish were exceptionally vigorous in extirpating idolatry. That's to say erasing and um, destroying the practices of uh, Andean traditional religion. And of course the artists were not so eager to give it up and found creative ways to include it in the artwork. Um, so here's another one, a Virgin of the Almudena. Um, it's probably from a group, uh, a workshop uh, in the 17th century, let's say the 1600s, associated with Basilio Santa Cruz Pumacayao. Um, I like this one for the same reason. You see again, this halo of gold leaf, which is a material again, uh, uh, associated with uh, Inca, um, Inca sun veneration, uh, as well as these celestial kinds of rays. But in looking at this one, I also noticed um, what we might think of as a reference to uh, the constellation, uh, the, the dark way constellation within uh, the Milky Way of the serpent uh, being uh, laying across um, the Virgin's uh, tunic here. Of course, you see a, a more typical halo here. And it's interesting to think of these Spanish looking characters now that I'm looking at it, perhaps being represented with more traditional halos. But um, so uh, the Virgin of uh, Almudena would have showed up in this place. Um, but perhaps the deities themselves, the more central deities being associated with deeper local religion by getting special solar inspired halos as a kind of reference to the depth of Andean religion or, or the, the, the connection thereof. So here again, we see the Lord of Sorrows. So this is actually from the 19th century. It's anonymous, uh, again, at the Museo Pedro de Osma in, in Barranco Lima. But um, again, you see a uh, Christ figure himself wearing gold leaf and having not just a regular halo, but again, uh, solar inspired uh, rays coming out. Is this a suggestion that Inti is being conflated with, uh, um, with Jesus? I think it's tough to avoid that, that suggestion. Uh, and finally, I wanna show you another one by the circle or the sort of workshop of Basilio Santa Cruz Pumacayao. Uh, this is again, early, late 17th century, early 18th century. So late 1600s, early uh, 1700s. And the gold leaf here is just tremendous. It's outshining uh, the oil paint itself. Of course, you have a, a dark background. But the use of gold leaf extensively in what we call Cusco style art or uh, colonial art, a lot of this was done around Cusco, now housed in, in Lima, although they have some in Cusco as well, of course, um, is a suggestion that there is a strong legacy into the 17th, 18th, and even 19th century of Inca solar belief or solar veneration being mashed up with and applied and connected with uh, theme, Christian themes in art. All right, so I'm gonna take you uh, back to Cusco to see how uh, this interest in gold and the sun gets applied to colonial architecture. So here we are um, at uh, San Pedro Apostol. It's a church in Andalajas. Uh, it was built by the Jesuits in the 16th century. So the late 1500s, very early in uh, the colonial period. 
uh, just after the Spanish arrived. Um, it's actually over a pre-Columbian huaca, that's to say a pre-Columbian temple, that's to say a pre-Columbian place that was thought of as a place where the various pachas or realms connected. Um, probably completed between 1570 and 1606. Uh, Luis de Araño, um, is uh, the, the person who's thought to have completed the work and the Amurejar style using what's identified, at least by the World Monuments Fund, as kurkur, which is uh, cane and straw with mud instead of wood and other kinds of materials. We would call this on the coast quincha, which would be cane and straw and mud. Um, so I want to point out that this is at 10,000 feet above sea level. So if Mile High Stadium in Denver is 5,000 feet above sea level, this is two mile high church, uh, really high altitude. Um, it's also called the Sistine Chapel of the Andes because it looks like this inside. So this is a Baroque style, that, again, done in the late 1500s and early 1600s. And if you thought that this thing was covered in gold, you were right. This has a ton of gold leaf. It is absolutely iridescent with gold. And while all of the imagery is essentially Christian fundamentally, uh, of course, that gold leaf tips us off to uh, a continued legacy of uh, the Inca and Andean interest in our star, the sun. Um, and it's not just the material itself. As you move closer in detail, uh, you will see that um, the over, over the altar itself, you have um, an image of, well, it's a circle with rays uh, and stars. You very much have a sun here. Uh, you have a lamb uh, inside. And I wanna point out, it's interesting to think uh, about Andean uh, indigenous ideas because when the Spanish showed up, they actually referred to the llamas that were central to Andean life Andean animal husbandry as ovejas, which means they called them sheep. Um, and so, so really what we have here is perhaps a celestial llama or what might be read by those who know as, as a, a, a loose reference to Andean ideas, certainly as couched within Inti perhaps, the sun itself, uh, right above uh, the, the altar in a Christian church. So Again, we have this kind of syncretism, uh, mixing and applying of Andean ideas about the sky and how the sky relates to deities, particularly Inti, as brought about perhaps by the Inca king Pachacuti that have a legacy into Christian practice in the late 1500s uh, in architecture here in Andalusia, but also in art as we saw in earlier um, earlier artworks at the Museo Pedro de Osma. I'll also point out that this interest in Inca celestial concerns continues today because Inti Raimi continues to be celebrated in Cusco. And here you have uh, in the Huacaypata itself, uh, the procession of uh, a ceremonial uh, of an Inca here. And, and again, I, I would, I always guess that this is Pachacuti who is uh, a very early, well-attested Inca. Some of the earlier ones may have been mythical, um, but Pachacuti really seems to be at the center of the explosion, uh, uh, rapid expansion of the Inca empire, the ushering in of the sun cult. And here we have, and of course, Inti Raimi, that's to say the celebration at the June solstice, uh, the beginning of a new growing season and at the beginning of a new solar year, if you will, being celebrated even today. And uh, you guessed it, they are festooned with gold, that very material uh, of the sun itself. So um, I think I will leave it at that. I look forward to questions. Uh, I'll be happy to show you uh, more these images again, listen to more music, just don't ask me to dance. <laughs> And should oh. I stop sharing now then? Yeah. Okay. I mean, if we need to again, that would be fine. I'm sure right. Victoria will have some questions, but I wanted to point out a couple of things. Um, one of the things you mentioned about uh, the dark lanes being mm -hmm. the dark lanes, yes. what people saw, mm -hmm. um, I found out relatively recently that other people in the Southern Hemisphere, especially in Australia, did the same. 
Um, so I, I wonder why, because we can see the Milky Way at our latitude if we're in a dark enough place. Um, but anyway, there seems to be a theme, a, a, a similarity there, which I yeah. always find interesting. Yeah, well, what what that, that's really interesting to know, and, and I'm not surprised. I mean, I, I think one of the, the, the immediate thought that comes to mind is the notion of perhaps people, uh, indigenous people looking closer, deeper and more extensively and finding uh, more, you know, in their sort of everyday lives, uh, even more richness than, than, than we're accustomed to find. I, I know we can see that the Milky Way, but, but I never thought about the, um, the dark lanes as, as being, um, uh, being, being constellations because they're what we would call in a way negative space, right? But, right. but they're not negative. They are they are their own thing. So there's layers upon layers. And if you know, if you're sort of looking to nature to be your sort of uh, the basis of your your worldview, uh, then you'll find lots and lots of richness. So yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to say was uh, that the uh, the Pleiades works in the southern hemisphere uh, the way you describe it because they're multiple uh, multiple crop possibilities, mm -hmm. but there are other places in the world also, Sirius, for example, was used when you can see it in the first in the morning, when it first appeared in the dawn, mm -hmm. I think it was time in the Mediterranean to start uh, getting your fields ready. So this concept of certain things rise, that something I need to do, I think is a widespread idea. Yeah. yeah, well, I'll point out, so so to, to kind of riff on that a little bit, um, the notion of those those three realms, you know, Hanampacha, uh, Kaipacha, and, and Uhupacha, you know, the rising or setting of a celestial phenomenon mm -hmm. could be thought of as a time when those realms connect. And actually the connection of realms, I, I, I discussed um, the notion of wakas, sacred places as being the best term I ever heard was like a sort of tear in the world membrane, like where the sort of veil that separates our world from the spirit world is actually broken. It's, but the other way, another concept that, that we didn't talk about in the Andes is that of tinkui, which is a coming together of things, the, the, the uh, convergence of important things. So actually forks and rivers become really important sites for temples. You could also think of tinkui as well as a sort of the, hori the, the celestial body meeting the horizon. There's one other thing, and I didn't get a chance to get into this, that uh, the Huacaipata in Cusco is the center of a system of, um, of shrines uh, that, that radiate out. And it may very well be uh, that, well, I know those shrines uh, would also perhaps be connected with celestial phenomena. And the part that I don't know um, is whether or not those shrines were located uh, at vantage points where certain celestial bodies would have crossed the horizon. But uh, it certainly could have been because there were several hundred, um, it's called the Seke system. There were several hundred shrines on these routes out of, of the center of Cusco that coordinated both space, but because they were shrines that were meant to be, um, I guess the word is venerated at specific times, it also uh, marked uh, an ordering of time. And of course, we're talking about stars or constellations rising and setting, which is in fact a temporal act. Um, now this is you know, well beyond my expertise uh, in terms of, of the Andes. You know, my, my specialty is not uh, um, uh, looking at constellations, but uh, there's, there's a couple of volumes out there that, that I think uh, with, within just a few minutes, you could, you could check my, my assumption here. But, um, but yeah, that, that makes sense that the center of Cusco as a center of a series of pathways that uh, touch upon shrines that order space and time were probably linked with the setting and rising of various celestial phenomena because those are in fact uh, time specific events. I'll ask one more question and then I'll sure. encourage Victoria if, if there are questions from the audience, but this is completely practical. <laughs> is it possible? I'm just thinking of a place that has such tall mountains that there probably is snow that melts down, not to mention that some of the uh, Pacific waters can be pretty cold. Can you swim on the coast of Peru? Oh yeah, uh, and, and you can swim for sure. And and uh, and famously so, uh, you'll recall, uh, is it Surf and Safari by the Beach Boys? 
where they go on a surf and safari from Oahu to the shores of Peru. Well, that north coast, they're referring to Mancora, which is a very famous surfing beach where that has the longest, uh, the longest left breaking wave in the world, which I'm told surfers really like left breaking waves. I don't know what that means, but um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a beach town. I mean, it's a beach country that the, the whole coast is, is all, um, is all beaches, but you're correct. It's particularly cold and, and it's worth saying why. So the water of Peru is very cold, which does two important things relating to the Incas uh, and perhaps our talk. Number one, the cold water is, is formed because of the, the, the Pacific plate goes under the South American plate, the plate tectonics does subduction. It pushes down the trench under the water in the near coastal area and it pushes up the Andes. So the Andes mountains are growing and the ocean I think is getting deeper, but in any case, it's very deep. Number one, that's why we have really tall, craggy and growing mountains there. Number two, what's going on under the surface right off the coast, it's very cold water, which means a lot of oxygen, which means very high biomass, which means lots and lots of fish, which means lots of protein for settled society really early. So you can swim there, People do surfing. It's you know lots of beaches uh, on the coast of Peru. I can recommend some if you plan on going. Um, but but it it's cold, but it, not prohibitively so by any means. And of course the air is quite warm because you're basically you know seven degrees south of the equator. You're you're really close. Uh, so pretty good pretty good time. Hence ceviche, um, which is of course uh, raw fresh fish. And in Peru, they're you know it's it's not uncommon to find stuff that's pulled right out of the ocean, and they'll they'll make you a uh, a nice ceviche right there. There's nothing better than that. <laughs> that sounds good. That sounds great. Well, Victoria, do we have any questions from from our audience? Uh, we don't have any questions right now. I'm wondering how often you spend, like how much time out of the year do you usually spend in Peru, like during a normal? Yeah, well, it depends. I mean, our typical field seasons, uh, when we go down there, you know, um, for doing research, you want to be there at least three weeks. Uh, and then getting longer into, say, um, you know, six weeks starts getting long if you have a family. Uh, I mean, I, I spent the better part of a year there in graduate school as a, as a, a Fulbright fellow. Um, but yeah, and what we're doing now, actually, um, partially as a response to the difficulties in travel is we're using um, satellite imagery to map sites on the coast of Peru. I have, I have students here uh, who are doing that sort of visual mapping. We can see rooms down to you know six feet by six feet, which is very small actually. That's like a storeroom, um, a closet essentially. Uh, and, then, and then we actually have a team on the ground who was working today uh, who then goes and uses, believe it or not, cell phones. Um, uh, and the GPS and the cell phone allows them to locate themselves within our map down to the room number and then collect data on the objects, you know, down to the size of a quarter. This is sort of, sort of actually cinquenta centimos is the size of the coin um, that we use as our smallest artifact that we care about. And, and they're actually actively uploading that information using cellular networks. Uh, which is a way of, of essentially uh, not necessarily minimizing the time that I have to go down there, but maximizing our ability to do work year round and include students and others um, in that kind of research. It remains to be seen in the, in the near future what field seasons will look like. Um, I think the world is definitely changing for, for in certain ways, uh, we have to be very judicious. Um, and the areas like where you, I work right by Chunkio, actually that like the site that I work at we look at Chunkio. In fact, I think the people who made the site that I work at probably located themselves there so they could see Chunkio and other even older sites because they cared about the, the, the age of the landscape and probably saw that as a kind of sacredness. Um, but you know, it's, it's hard to get to the provincial city and harder to get to the countryside and therefore anything we can do to facilitate research and make it more efficient uh, is, gonna be really, is gonna be really beneficial. Um, which yeah. might be to say to minimize time in certain ways. And money. <laughs> Speaking um, of money, I have a question. Mm -hmm. How did the Incas respond to the influx of coins? How did they respond to money? Yeah, that is a great question. 
So there's a couple, I don't have a direct and specific answer for how they responded to money. And gosh, it would be interesting um, to hear somebody, to, to, to find someone, you know, accounting for the, what they thought of as coins uh, and coinage. We do know they saw gold very differently than the Spanish. And, and the old sort of, um, I guess, morbid joke is that, that illustrates this is when Atahualpa was captured by the Spanish and held for ransom, the Spanish were like, we'll let you go if you fill your, if you have, bring, have your, you know, your, your retainers, bring us and fill this room twice. And, you know, Atahualpa was like, oh no, what's he going to say? And they're like, with gold. And he was like, oh, thank goodness he said gold. Um, because gold itself, he's like, I don't know, I got a lot of gold. This is, you know, it's my, it's, it's my privilege to have the gold. It doesn't really worth anything because it was in fact cloth which has a lot of labor stored in it, essentially, has a lot of people working on it. A lot of people are dependent upon to do it. It requires a lot of managing the economy to get people to, to harvest the wool, to dye the wool, to finish it, to spin it, uh, to then uh, weave it. That is a huge sector of the economy. The gold was much easier for him to, to, to get a hold of. So in terms of how do they respond to money, they certainly, we, we, we say that they certainly did had a very different view of of the value of objects uh, than the Spanish did at first. However, on the flip side, uh, and this relates to say Juan Poma and other early writers uh, who, were, who were either indigenous or um, were from families that were a mix of indigenous and Spanish in that early colonial period, the, 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 they figured out pretty quickly uh, and integrated themselves pretty quickly into the Spanish bureaucratic system. So a lot of the records we have are records of people um, are records of people, uh, basically uh, indigenous people making claims in court, being like, sure, I, you know, I get it. You guys have a court. We have a We understand how that works. And I am a direct descendant of the last Inca who was unfairly deposed. I have 400 hectares over here that this Spanish guy came and took, but actually I have a legitimate claim to it more so than this other guy. Uh, and, and so they understood the, the bureaucratic system. And conversely, um, it seems that after the Spanish showed up and the conquistadors, who I think of as kind of like a mixture of cowboy mercenary venture capitalist, um, after they kind of wrecked the system that was there, it was actually the Spanish crown who was like, guys, like number one, you're, you, you toppled a monarchy. We don't do that. We, we superimpose ourselves on top of them. But like, you know, uh, you don't, regicide is, is, is a universally, um, um, understood evil among European rulers. And the notion that the conquistadors committed regicide was a real problem once, uh, once the, the Spanish figured it out, um, both, both from a moral perspective, I mean, uh, and also from the perspective of the fact that like, if you mess up their bureaucratic system, we can't map ourselves on top of it now, can we? Um, so, so while on the one hand, to, to, to bring it back around to your question, the notion of money itself would have, I don't have a, we don't really have a good sense, or I, I certainly don't know if we have a good sense of how the, the um, Incas and their, and their descendants would have looked at it. We do know that they looked at the value of materials differently, but also that both the Incas under, very quickly came to understand uh, the, the Spanish system. And in fact, more so than we might recognize the Spanish crown understood at least to some degree um, how similar or parallel the Inca system would have been and uh, recognize the problems provoked by the, the quick sort of destruction or disruption by the conquistadors who were sort of like, you know, um, I mean, they were rough and tumble, rough and tumble guys. Uh, and and were, were, you know, there for, you know, military purposes when they could have used diplomatic means for the crown's benefit, frankly. Yeah, I like those questions. I have a, uh much less loaded question, which is, what's your favorite part about visiting Peru? <laughs> oh, man. So I have two answers <laughs> that came to mind. Uh, sort of word association. I mean, the food is great. I was uh, going to say, I mean, obviously, it's got to be the food, right? <laughs> yeah, food. the food is fantastic. They, I mean, they'll really say uh, Peru can be a culture shock because the proximity and the level of poverty to wealth can be really shocking. Um, However, uh, I guess family structures and extended family structures and what our, you know, sort of anthropologists would call like um, fictive family structures, meaning everybody has a lot of TS and TOs, uncles and aunties, 
and they I, I've seen it and been involved with the, the redistribution of stuff. So they, there is always there's a saying that essentially goes, you know, we don't have a lot of money in Peru, but but everybody eats well. And I think that's kind of true. And not only is there like sort of plenty, I, I mean, there's there's a lot of issues, especially in the mountains with with uh, food distribution and stuff. But but really, there's a lot of really good food. It's extremely flavorful. It's a mix of indigenous Spanish um, Asian, there's been there's been an Asian influence since the 1800s. Um, flavors. Um, Lima is a metropolitan city with lots of highly innovative chefs and 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 then also really deep traditions, which is really cool. The other part is I got to say, and I always say this, there is something about that landscape that is magic. Uh, I mean, there is just something about being in these expansive, um, you know, extreme kind of landscapes that are are alternately lush or minimalistic. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know, there's magnetism there or something. I don't, I'm, I'm kind of kidding, but but there you get a special feeling and you can understand why the notion of a waka, a sort of place with a lot of spiritual energy where you can connect with a, I guess, I guess you would say, you know, this, this connection of pachas, of worlds, we might think of it as, I mean, there's some pretty sublime places there. Um, you you kind of sense the sublime in a lot of parts of the landscape and that is is really a favorite thing. Plus there's really cool people and friends and colleagues there but I like that food and landscape I'll go with food and landscape kind of too yeah. eating eating it outdoors mm -hmm. on that some mountains too. <laughs> I think that's a great place to end it great um yeah well thank well, you very much I want to travel there right now <laughs> okay great this was a wonderful presentation. It was wonderful to, to hear more about it and you transported us so beautifully in time and space. Well, thanks very much for inviting me and I look forward to the next installment of Culturas Celestiales. Thank you, gracias. <laughs> hey, Thank you, Persona Poli. Yeah, yo soy el pai. Took me a moment to figure out.